Hello everyone, good evening. My name is Ika Chuku Onyweni. I'm a curatorial assistant here at the Hammer Museum. I also served as an assistant curator of performance for Made in LA 2020, a version, which was co-curated by my dear colleagues, Lauren Mackler and Miriam Bensala. Tonight, you'll be witness to a few things. First, if you aren't familiar with Beyond Baroque, then this event will provide an orientation of sorts to one of the longest, to the longest running literary art centers in the West Coast based out in Venice, California. And I believe um, two years ago was um, the 50th anniversary of Beyond Baroque. Um, the activities of Beyond Baroque from 1976 to 1986 is also something that you become familiar with. Um, and that's due to the fact that it has been the focus of writer, critic, and Made in LA participant, Sabrina Tarasov. Um, Sabrina seized upon this period and particularly the poetic license that were taken up by the poets who were broadly speaking interested in this post 1960s malaise and the dwindling optimism of the hippie movement and the feelings that come after that figurative death of these social movements. Um, and that doesn't do justice to this poet gang beyond Baroque during this era and let alone Sabrina's impetus, um, because I feel Sabrina's desire to delve into this dizzying drunken darkness that these poets were interested in is large and vast. And to kind of capture that vastness, I would suggest taking a gander at Sabrina's reflection on her research in Extra Journal titled Grandiose Delusions as a Form of Escape from Reality Resulting from a Feeling of What? And I think for Sabrina, she was interested in what that feeling was. Um, alongside this uh, piece from Sabrina is a really interesting uh, lecture that was delivered by Lauren Mackler, again, the Made in LA curator. And um, during a lunchtime art talk, she delivered a very rich reading and exposition on Sabrina's work that is featured in the biennial um, across the Hammer and the Huntington. And that recording can be found on the Hammer's channel. But returning to this specific era of Beyond Baroque, these halcyon years were headed up by Dennis Cooper, who ran the live programming and started up a very ambitious series uh, of readings, workshops, and he also invited poets and writers from across the country to come to Venice and to animate the poetry community in Los Angeles. Alongside Cooper was Jack Skelly, who Sabrina will be, conversation, will be in conversation with tonight. Um, and Jack ran the graphic center at Beyond Baroque and there he produced small press books and also organized the music programming at the center. Now this hive of activity caught the attention of Gail Kaczynski, uh, who was a filmmaker who started coming to Beyond Baroque events in 1982. Um, so in collaboration with the poets there, she began shooting footage for what would become Fear of Poetry, the 1983 documentary that you're about to see. So Kaczynski shot footage over several weeks that focused on a few members of this poet gang, including Amy Gersler, um, the late poet, artist, and performer, Bob Flanagan, the artist, performer, and also Bob's partner, uh, Cherie Rose, um, the late poet, Ed Smith, and the writer and musician, Jack Skelly, that you're gonna hear from later, and also Jocelyn Fisher, who was the director of Beyond Baroque at the time. Now the film, which clocks in at 75 minutes, is actually a rough cut. And Dennis Cooper noted how after Kaczynski finished shooting the footage, she organized a screening for the film to gather feedback at a downtown Los Angeles gallery. However, after the screening, Kaczynski subsequently left the city, moved to Chicago, and it was assumed that the documentary project had been abandoned because no one really heard from her. Then according to Cooper, and I quote, some mysterious person uploaded the rough cut in multiple parts on YouTube. Sabrina got her hands on the footage through David Trinidad, a key member of this poet gang. Now it's interesting, this exchange of the rough cut footage across time, space and platforms probably speaks the low res quality to a fear of poetry that you're going to see. Again, the film was made in 1982 and it's possible that the original footage aged and decayed badly due to a lack of preservation and conservation. For me though, it's interesting this reappearance of Kaczynski's footage online 
and on YouTube of all places is almost akin to this ontological subject matter that these poets were grappling with in their work, but also how Sabrina remediated their poems and prose within a context that is somewhat foreign to the origin. And I stress that in terms of what you'll see at the Huntington in terms of the haunted house. And I think it's a haunting that is grounded not just in this return to this feeling of sublime nothingness, but actual death, um, which is an absence that tugs at something incalculable, vast, and painful. And that is very kind of germane to the movement and the poetry that was coming out from this Beyond Baroque period. Cooper noted that a year after the film was shot, the scene dissolved and evolved into something else. And I think in a way, fear of poetry becomes one of the many hauntings of Beyond the Rook that will frame the conversation you're about to tap into between Jack and Sabrina. Um, now onto their bios. Um, again, Sabrina is an independent writer and critic, uh, formerly based in Pasadena, but now is working out of Paris. Um, and in recent years, her work has focused on this nebulous poet gang that formed around the poetry workshops at Beyond Baroque during the period of 1976 to 1986. And a bit of context, Beyond Baroque was founded in the early 1960s by George Drury Smith um, in a storefront in Dallas, California. And upon its founding, Beyond Baroque quickly became a site for gathering, workshop in writing, art performances, conversations, and it is still very much active today. Um, over the last four decades, it's featured numerous writers, poets, and artists, including Exine Sovenka, Michelle Clinton, Wanda Coleman, John Doe, Jim Isserman, um, Ron Kurtke, Bill Moore, Michael Silverblatt, Benjamin Weissman, and Bruce and Norman Unimoto. And I think from this scene, Tarasov's research and materials um, a given an unconventional and experiential form um, by connecting the scene's curiosity about spaces designed to house fantasy with the process of restaging a recent archive in a manner that embodies the ethos of this poet gang. Um, Sabrina is presenting an ambitious series of programs. Sorry, an ambitious series of programs that rallies the poets and artists who have been the subject of her research. Um, one of those programs is um, called Tea with Tosh, um, and it's based on a restaging of this late 1980s cable show hosted by the writer Tosh Berman, in which he interviewed various figures from the literary scene. Um, so Sabrina will be restaging that and um, hosting a new set of conversations. Alongside that um, is the Huntington presentation that Sabrina created, which is an improvised haunted house that she put together in collaboration with Twisted Experiential. Um, and each room within this haunted house guides the viewer through archival materials related to Beyond Baroque and the ephemera, as well as installations that experientially embody the work of Dennis Cooper, Bob Flanagan and Shirley Rose, Amy Gersler, Jack Skelly, and Ed Smith and David Trinidad. In terms of Jack Skelly's bio, he is a writer, musician, and publicist in Los Angeles. Um, and his poetry and that of others can be featured, is featured in the Beyond Baroque art installation at the Huntington um, and is part of Made in LA 2020 version. Um, again, thank you so much for being here tonight. Enjoy the program between Sabrina and Jack and the movie also of the documentary of fear of poetry thank you very much hi sabrina hi jack how's the how's the weather in sweden it's very sunny sunny for time being well that's not fair because it's may gray here i uh, know it's my favorite period of la weather <laughs> <laughs> i bet it is mm -hmm. So this is great. I'm really happy to be doing this with you today. Um, just so everyone's kind of clear on kind of what's happening. Um, Sabrina and I have spent the last week kind of going back and forth on what we're going to talk about today. And lots by um, uh, via mail and text and phone calls. And it's in this kind of very Tarasophian um, epistolary mode. 
where we're kind of emailing and back and forth ideas. So we're going to kind of present it in that way, kind of based on our conversation this week. And um, obviously, we're going to, I'm going to try to set the scene a little bit for what the bulk of the conversation, I think, will be Sabrina talking about what she wants to talk about, what we both do. But I'm going to kind of start off talking a little bit more. But Sabrina, obviously, just interrupt or tell me that I'm wrong or whatever, just at any point during that part or anywhere. Go for it. Okay. So kind of to set the stage, and the idea to set the stage is kind of a little bit of historical context, and it's all leading up to this screening of this Fear of Poetry documentary, which is all about Beyond Baroque, because everything here kind of revolves around that. And so just to set, you know, the kind of the background of Beyond Baroque, Beyond Baroque in Venice, it's the longest running literary arts center on the West Coast. Um, it's had their 50th anniversary two years ago, and it's still going strong today, despite, you know, even though there's a sort of a historical perspective that we're talking about today. Um, and Sabrina's Made in LA installation addresses a particular historical artistic scene. Um, can we have the first slide, please? So here's a calendar from this period of the early 80s at Beyond Baroque Literary Arts Center in the old Venice City Hall in Venice, California. Next slide, please. And this particular scene of, revolved around this guy. This guy is Dennis Cooper. And he kind of came into the institution in the early 80s and shook it up and gathered many, many people around him, many, 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 many people around him and uh, created a scene. It was sort of christened by him and others, the gang. So we might be using that term here and there. And he, you know, he ran the Friday night reading series and was involved in much of the other programming, as was I. I was there during that time. Um, running the Graphic Center, producing small press books and the music program. So Dennis, surrounding Dennis, and next slide please, was an explosion of creativity, all kinds of stuff. This is a cover of his Little Caesar Press catalog. Next slide please. And here's an inside page from this Little Caesar Press catalog. He was producing dozens of books during this time. And then members of the gang, did the same thing. Hey, I want to have a press and I want to have Dennis in it or whatever. And everyone started doing that. And so really the, the impact that he's had, and we're all so grateful to Dennis, has just keeps happening. I mean, as you can see from Sabrina's thing now, there's just the ripples from Dennis's impact on the scene or have, will never end, I think. Is that all right, Sabrina? Absolutely. Yeah, that's, <laughs> um, yeah, that's a perfect intro to this. All right. So then... Sabrina's installation, Beyond Baroque, at the Huntington Library now, co-created with Zion Fenwick and their team at Twisted Haunts. Want to get that in there. Um, slide, please. It, it reanimates the spirits of eight core writers, artists, friends from this group, The Gang. And they are, those names are Dennis Cooper, Bob Flanagan and Sherry Rose, Amy Gristler, Mike Kelly, myself, as well as Ed Smith and David Trinidad. Slide, please. Oh, and I should add also Tony Orsler, um, Marnie Weber, Jim Shaw is in it, Bruce uh, Norman Yonemoto, potentially somebody I've forgotten, but that's pretty much the core. Marnie Weber, right, yes. They're all in there. And then there are many other members from the gang or from the scene that are referenced sort of obliquely throughout, primarily in that punk rock hallway section. Yes. Um, slide, please. This is the Dennis Cooper, I call it the tunnel of gifts. I don't yeah. it's like it's really <laughs> cool. To me, this is like Dennis Cooper's blog come to life. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna read and next slide, please. Um, I'm going to read just from what I wrote in, on Instagram late last year. Okay, and I'm, I named the, the members of the gang, Dennis, etc. All are or were my dear friends. Not all are still living, but versions of our spirits are here, murmuring through an erato animatronic dizzy land with punk rock loops. There are dreamlike beyond Baroque facades and hallways. Next slide, please. A Bob and Sherry dungeon, caves and brain tunnels. 
even an icily elegant shrine to Amy Gersler's book, Crispy, Christie's Alpine Inn, right there. The experience haunts me in the deepest possible way. And that is absolutely true. Uh, slide, please. And that is the kind of the punk rock hallway that, that Sabrina and her team put together. All right, so there's Beyond Baroque, the installation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That's an amazing intro. Oh, well, thank you. All thanks to you, really. They all, all, all thanks revert to Sabrina. Okay, and then next slide, please. Okay, so flashback to Beyond Baroque, December 1982. As I mentioned, I worked at Beyond Baroque during this period. Um, and we, uh, let's see, let's just kind of go through the next slide here. Here's another party. Basically, there was many parties happening at Beyond Baroque during this time. Many, many, many. Next slide, please. Many, many, many. Next slide, please. Many, many, many. Next slide, please. Many, many parties. And I know it's kind of tantalizing to look at these flyers and not explain them, but we got to get to the rest of the program. That, that was an amazing event right there, though. Oh, yeah. The mythic, the mythic Godzilla on the beach, it's which is, I should maybe hop in and say it was a kind of originating moment for me when I was kind of tumbling through my Kelly's CV at some point, trying to figure out what was going on in terms of performance and artistic projects and finding, um, finding the Godzilla on the beach line and figuring out these kind of cohesions between people like Jim Iserman, who I believe made Papier Mache sets for it, yes. or Mary Voronov, who played Godzilla in a kind of yes. bikini clad Papier Mache lizard head. Like this yes. really captured that the, the kind of spirit of um, the more ad hoc, experimental, fun, uh, you know, inebriate qualities of, of the scene. So I think that's yes. kind of it's a quintessential flyer. And inebriate is the key word. And, you know, I was there um, and it was, was an incredible event. And yes, Mary Warnoff was, played Godzilla in heels and bikini. And um, actually there's a Mike Kelly connection to all of these. Robert, could you go back two or three slides to the Dennis Cooper flyer? Keep going. So there's a Mike Kelly, I always put it in quotes, designed flyer. <laughs> I am. Um... And even the one before that, Robert, Halloween harvest, Halloween, I mean, come on, how perfect is that for all of this? Halloween harvest party. You know, this was for Mike Kelly and Amy Gersler's birthdays. All right, so let's go forward again, Robert. Again, 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 again. Thank you. So at one of these many parties, uh, there was one party in particular, it was titled The Wedding of Everything. This is December 1982. And this was captured in a documentary film by Gail Kaczynski, actually co-produced by Ed Smith, one of the members of the gang. Um, and the name of this documentary is Fear of Poetry. And we will show this documentary after our discussion here. And basically this, this Fear of Poetry, uh, the, the Wedding of Everything itself and Fear of Poetry is kind of a microcosm of the Beyond Baroque scene because many of the people that were at the, the fear of poet, the, the wedding of everything event, which is the name, I know it's getting confusing, layered, the, the wedding of everything, and there's the, the invite for it, was the name of the book that this party celebrated. The book was published by Sherwood Press, which is David Trinidad's press, who is a member of this core gang again. And there are many, mem many, many members of this, uh, group and really the whole kind of extended Beyond Baroque art family or whatever was involved in this particular event, which was a multimedia event with films and poetry reading and music and talking and kissing and drinking. And, and so the, even the event itself was a microcosm of Beyond Baroque because it included all these sort of different, you know, artistic ways of doing stuff. And so, um, and oh, I get one more point I want to make about that. So in this kind of the same way that the haunt, which is kind of Sabrina's term for the Beyond Broke installation, in the same way that that is a, it's in its own way, a, a distillation or microcosm of Beyond Baroque, even this event was, and so is the film that we're going to watch. So 
Sabrina and I, you know, we, we, like I said, we've been spent the last couple, couple days kind of talking about it and, um, and how this party, Sabrina kind of zeroed into on how this party um, has a relationship to her installation of Beyond Baroque and to her overall artistic vision, which explores relationships between poetry and art and, and here I'll take a deep breath, and this is not even exhaustive, but dark rides, Disneyland, emotional roller coasters and actual roller coasters, um, acid trips, drunken bummers, caves, tunnels of love, maybe tunnels of hate, um, and of course, haunted houses, haunted places of all kinds, haunting memories, and the Proustian memories that resurface and shock again and again and again, and many more themes that Sabrina explores in her work. Yeah. Is that accurate? <laughs> That's accurate. Yeah, I would say maybe just for a little bit of background too, it's that, um, you know, I, I'm sure the bios have been gone through at this point and to risk repeating myself, I think that my, my survey of the period, you're right to say that somehow um, beyond Baroque um, in the early 1980s was, uh, or my survey of Beyond Baroque was deeply occupied with defining these kind of unique qualities that formed between um, literary correspondences, but also personal ones, which evoked mm -hmm. this time and place, which was Los Angeles in the 1980s, but also um, really wanted to hone in on something that was coming out of a kind of, that created a new literary voice with a kind of lasting influence that was coming out of this ironic punk sensibility on one hand, um, but also reflecting this kind of like post 1960s malaise in some ways where, you know, the kind of, um, let's say elation and like ecstatic uh, political optimism of the hippie movement was kind of like crashing and burning in this moment into this kind of like, I don't give a fuck, um, expedient, like kind of lyric um, uh, hellscape somehow in the best possible sense. And, and so, you know, for me, when I got uh, into working with this, I was, I was trying to take a pretty playful experimental approach using focalizing lenses, which were like you say, the kind of Disneyland pirates and like astronauts and space guns and death skiffs and so on. Um, but only in so far as to find kind of poetic vehicles that really coalesce these poets, you know, textuality and kind of existential formation within the period. And so, um, I was writing about it originally and each kind of chapter, each part of the manuscript was again, a different type of ride. And I think as Lauren Mackler said the other day in a talk, um, the haunted house was sort of the chapter that wasn't written yet is somehow um, the whole project is built around the symbol of, of the haunt, um, of the haunted house as an artifact of past anxieties and events and these whispers of, of um, the kind of strangely homosocial bonds between you guys. Yeah, you know, it's amazing how what things you zeroed in on, but everything you said about the period and kind of how it changed and how, again, Dennis's impact on it is really rings true. And, you know, the punk rock thing, I'm, I think that gets maybe over uh, emphasized sometimes, but it's true that it was there. I and mean, we were all went to punk rock shows and I produced many, 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 many punk rock events at Beyond Baroque itself. And many yeah. of those are in the punk rock hallway at the installation. So, all right, so, you know, I'm kind of just gonna go now, Sabrina, into the things we talked about this week. Um, you told me how this party, this again, this wedding of everything party that's in the movie, conjures up this literary scenes, you used the phrase sublime hangovers. The idea of the ultimate party being the wedding of everything, and you said that this recalls for you artist Julie Becker discussing an attempt to imagine everything, to write everything into a single work, to hold everything. So um, I guess my question on this is, do you want to correlate this sense of grand ambition with the wedding of everything and your interest in Beyond Baroque in some way? Oh, that's a difficult question. I mean, I think with the wedding of everything, what I was thinking, especially in relation to to Gail's um, to Gail's documentary. So I guess I should maybe preface this. So Gail Krasinski's *Fear of Poetry* is as has probably 
uh, as we've introduced is, is a kind of miraculous little improvisatory 75-minute uh, document, which starts with a reading of Bob Flanagan's Wedding of Everything, as Jack said. And Krasinski, she's, or Krasinski, she was an aspiring filmmaker who kind of became a semi-regular and, and um, like myself, I think in some ways, and maybe there's a sort of grand empathy here that she was blown away by the eccentricities of these kind of brainy wild scribes who um, were presenting themselves. And there's this kind of, the prologue of the film opens up as you'll see with this kind of thick, sappy, saccharine artifice of, you know, um, opening credits that say, you know, it was the best of times, it was beyond Baroque and this kind of Dickensian sense of a period. And I was really, I think, interested in this idea of, of, you know, Bob's sort of ceremonial address and the idea of encapsulating a poetry practice, a performance practice, this party all at once. I think he opens up by saying something like, welcome to the wedding of every, everything, you'll all get a chance. Yes. And everybody kind of laughs and it rolls through different performances. And I think that you know, I bring up Julie Becker because I've been writing about Julie Becker right now. And for me as well, there's this kind of spiraling sense of trying to make everything as a part of this grand narrative. Maybe it's a, a kind of quasi Prussian thing, but moreover, it's about um, kind of living according to the ethos of a practice, which I think is quintessential to the kind of early or your beyond Baroque years in the 1980s, that there's a sort of like unadulterated hedonism, a kind of clement, quirky humor, as I've written, but also um, this matrimonial spirit of the wedding of everything is really an attempt not to condense a scene into, let's say, an ism or an ideology or a poetic movement, per se, in its more kind of socio-historical sense, but into something where where you know, you'll all get a chance, where every, everyone's kind of wedded to each other because of of, of this kind of togetherness. And, and that has everything to do with the sort of idea of the perfect dinner party, or in this case, the kind of perfect out of control, um, you know, inspirited night um, or many of them. Yeah, I mean, that's so true. And I remember Bob kind of hatching this idea for this event. And I, I love the name of that book and the, just that whole concept, the wedding of everything as a confirmed punk rock rom romanticist. I mean, it reminds me of William Blake's The Marriage of Heaven and Hell, yes. which is kind of what's happening, too, in all of Absolutely. this. Absolutely. And, and there's this kind of quirky um, contradiction within it, you know, with the kind of um, wedding singer-esque attire that Bob is wearing. And he'll, he says something at some point, he says, solid, as a family, we are solid. And in the meanwhile, everybody's kind of falling all over each other, and there's booze everywhere, and everybody's yeah. in raucous laughter. And so there's this kind of, um, this idea of, being all over the place or kind of out of control or a total mess while simultaneously finding a sort of structure or scaffolding within the scene itself. For sure. And the, that mess, but the, again, that mess kind of derives from the ambition of the whole thing. Let's just make this thing as big and as wide and as all encompassing as possible. And it reminds me of what the, the part that Dennis Cooper has in the movie where he's asked about you know, why, the, the manifesto for his magazine, Little Caesar magazine. And he says, our magazine is going to be read by, you know, movie stars and Dodger fans or something like that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that really was his ambition. I mean, now if you ask him that, he'll kind of, you know, say, oh, that was crazy. But, you know, why not? Well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I remember that so clearly and he has this charisma and he's smoking and talking and this was sort of formative for at least the ethos of writing this, you know, in some ways for me, this teen spirit of let us introduce ourselves. We're not 50 year old patrons of the arts. We're young punks just like you. And he goes on into this kind yes. of really beautiful, again, a marriage between American an American pop cultural consciousness and the ideal of sort of a 19th century lyricism as the kind of height of of um of teen idolatry in some ways so likening kind of the dodgers or the um right. to apollinaire <laughs> or whatever i love how you tie that into it too the, the teen idol dennis cooper had a book called idols yes you know, and the whole oh, pop yeah. culture thing you know is all big with me and all of us so but I mean, it's one thing that I wanted to ask you as well, where when we were sharing materials together, you were sharing kind of journal entries of this. And what I noticed, and we talked about this a little bit, was this sort of very bleak, uh, oblique and brief reference to how much preparation went into this and how much practices um, 
counted into this, even though it has a sort sort of ad hoc feeling to it, or even if it seems kind of out of control. Right. Um, yeah. That is so true. This is again a way this whole experience has been haunting for me. So I've delved into all my quote Jack Skelly archives, which are really just you know my journals of the period <laughs> were just packed with these you know uh, things I didn't know were there flyers and stuff many of which made their way into the haunt but also full of my journal entries at the time so it was only just a couple of days ago that I read my journal entry for the day after this event and yes it, was, it talks about how <laughs> we're practicing like every night this week and we're getting high in stone and I forget what I did last night <laughs> and then it even and then actually that feeds into our next part here because it that night was a crazy night for me and Though you can't see, you can't see it in the film, the second half of the film is happens the next day when I was very very hungover, very hungover. But I I must have masked it. I think I did very well. And so you use the term yourself, sublime hangover, right? Um, you said there is an inevitable aftermath of such an ambitious attempt. Thoughts that tumble and fall, flail overconsume, fill with regret, and see the soft light of morning as an aggression, a cruel awakening. What is that space of downtrodden enlightenment, a kind of anvil-esque flattening of subjectivity? High verse fallen flat on, I love that flat, high verse fallen flat on its ass to match the images of pop culture. That's the end of your quote. I would just, also, I just want this idea of high verse fallen on its ass, to match images of pop culture, I feel like <laughs> describes the work of many of us, especially me, but really all of us in a way. Cause there's, like you said, there's this elevated tone to some of it. And then it definitely comes down to, you know sort of basic level sometimes too. Yeah. I mean, there's so many moments for me within the, the poetic works of the era where, you know, I, I became very obsessed, especially when I was starting out writing about this, about the kind of idea of poetry going kerplunk on its ass, or like right. the idea of the sort of sad trombone in the background. Like making a cartoon. It sort of like, wah, 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 you know, yes. and there's this sort of, this idea of um, what I, I, I'm writing about in relation to Ed Smith, the kind of bathos of impact or the moment when maybe the sublime arrives, but it's also a kind of disappointment or it's followed by the inevitable kind of crashing come down of, of, of experience. And, and I think that to me, this period and these poetic works and the kind of humor that was implied with them had a lot to do with that, that bathos, um, which I actually, as a term, the bathos of impact stole mm -hmm. from an article on jackass which I love to. <laughs> um, in which many but that's kind of fall. the idea of like yeah, the home right. skits, the the sort right. of backyard um, sketches <laughs> and daredevilry or something. Right, and falling on your ass. Yeah. Um, okay, this, I don't know if this is redundant to what we just said, but here's another line you gave me the other day. I keep thinking to the figure of the crash that undergirds some of my work on the period implied is not only the crash as a malfunction of the ride, and hopefully we can talk about rides, the malfunction of the, the ride or some more fatal mistake, but the crashing come down, the, here it is, the bathos of impact delivered with gin clear and post-drunken expedience. And all this for the sake of examining the repercussions of, okay, of examining the reper repercussions of some higher form of violence. So that, like, when you wrote that to me, higher form of violence, like, what? And I'm kind of, I didn't ask you what you meant by that. So I'm going to ask you now, like, what, what is the higher form of violence here? I wonder, I mean, it sounds a little naff somehow, or a little too easy to say that the higher form of violence is verse, or at least the inscription um, of an idea onto a page, but at the same time, I think that's really where it was coming from. I think when I was reading my thesis, I was or writing my thesis, I was reading lots of Blanchot and thinking about the idea of kind of trying to write into disasters or into kind of unapproachable experiences and limit cases in particular. And, you know, on one hand, this has to do with sort of um, 
maybe traumatic experiences or like actual calamities in the world or grief mm -hmm. or something like that. But it's also, I think about, to me, about the act of writing itself and about the way that the self becomes sort of um, etched into, into, um, in, into a written format in an, in, or set to verse in somehow. And, you know, I, I've been kind of obsessed with this idea of, um, of writing or writing within this period as a, as a sort of, as emblematically violent, or at least testing the limits of what, how violent you can be within, within the format. And this comes through in Dennis's work in some ways and, and Ed's work, um, yours to a certain degree also. And, but it, it's always about this kind of um, momentum and change, uh, change and like, and, and motion blur. And I would say in this case, violence isn't so much like a, a kind of cruelty as it is about like the psychoesthetics of, of instability and fragility or the kind of, um, the kind of a test of subjectivity to see, you know, which, um, how, how far you can go before it snaps or what the, the kind of carrying capacity of writing is in the sense that makes any, any yeah, sense. Very much so. Yeah. You know, and it, it goes back to your, um, your sort of very keen attunement to the tone and message or, or, um, approach of this whole group of writers. Um, I mean, it's really amazing how you've really zero in on them. You mentioned Ed Smith and you actually, you have an article coming out, I think next week on Los Angeles Review of Books about yeah. Ed Smith. You know, he's one of the, <laughs> he's no longer with us. I mean, it's, there's some violence in, right there, you know, and really, we all really miss him a lot. So I'm really looking forward to reading what you say about him. Um, and, and, and then in this part, when we were having our discussion this week, you wrote, no wonder some people have a fear of poetry while others live for the hangover. It's calamitous insight. It makes me think of Ed's, Ed Smith's short poem, um, The Church and the All Night Party. And this little snippet from the poem, the best part was you came and sat next to me. And I just wanna interrupt myself right there. When I was looking back at my journal entries the other day, there's a part there where it says about, and I sat next to Dennis Cooper, <laughs> And we, I don't know, we'd had some kind of fight or something, some, you know, before, and we're just like, we totally patched it up. And we talked about life and love and everything. And it was so great. So the best part was when <laughs> I sat next to him. Um, and then you also quote Amy Gersler um, on the same theme, night spirals like drunken thoughts or DNA. So I guess here's my question, you know, this theme of the downward spiral, and you've already kind of addressed it, the inevitable crash, the Disney dark ride breaking down or running off the rails. You know, is there anything else you want to say that uh, in terms of your understanding of this, the work of this gang? Um, I mean, I guess in this, again, it harps back to like an interest in, in kind of mobility and change and, and the idea of the poetic vehicle, which really I'm just kind of appropriating from Rambeau and, and thinking into like what the, the sort of 21st century equivalent of the drunken boat might be, right. particularly um, knowing that this sort of the, the drunken boat was emblematic or an, an analogical to the poetic voice and a poetic voice that, that Rambeau especially sort of intuited or had this kind of extra logical intuition about its its inevitable sinking you know like the boat of youth or whatever you want to call it um is doomed and, and destined to kind of um to disappear and i i think for me i was so infatuated with this idea of kind of entering spaces that were temporary, temporary systems that could impose on subjectivity. So like the ride, the dark ride in particular, the roller coaster as these sort of moments where a kind of faux, um, like tacky simulated uh, ex sort of ersatz experience of the world could be had within like a kind of small th thrill or whatever. Um, and I think, it became about this question of control. Like I, we've talked about your poem 
a helium kid in space mountain and it's about this kind of there's this kind of crucial moment where the ride breaks down and then the poem loops back in and on itself and i think these these moments when you have a like the the sort of facade breaks and you have a glimpse into the the unreality of something and then it gets starts back again is like where we kind of get in touch with some sort of childish mode of fear that's that's really kind of creative and and exciting and i think that's that's there within all of these these poetic works i mean in terms of ed something that i i like to talk about is is um you know what bruce hanley called as ed smith making tiny toy bombs or something and there's these kind of they're small like, like miniaturist explosion uh, explosions that um are really cartoonish in some ways, but but impactful and and meant to kind of detonate something, whether that's like the canon of poetry or or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if that answers your question at all, but it does, and I feel like we could go down the list, you know, and kind of of all the you know the roster of all the poets, and you could kind of riff on them, but alas, but, but you did mention, um, okay, so Rambo's the drunken boat, and I guess we should kind of explain, we talk about your thesis, it starts off with this incredible, I mean, this is one another thing that blew my mind and changed my life when you first reached out to me over a year ago. You sent me this thesis that starts off with this uh, <laughs> metaphorical comparison of the drunken boat with the Pirates of the Caribbean ride. <laughs> it's like, what? Oh my God, this is so great, because like, I mean, why didn't anybody think of this before? And it really is a perfect parallel and the way you um, spin it out is, is incredible. But it was pure drunken logic in some ways where there's a strange coincidence that the kind of low lying um, Louisiana hovercrafts that they use as the ride vehicle on Pirates of the Caribbean is called the Bateau and it's misspelt. Right. So it's spelt with two T's. Oh. And I thought it was a kind of funny, um, like a, a an Americanization or a bastardization of this idea of the the drunken boat because really in Pirates for anybody who's been on the ride in Disneyland you go through scenes of kind of cocktail parties and drunken cavorting <laughs> and pilfering and you know raping like intelligence yeah exactly <laughs> and the ride was really quite not safe for work in some ways in its right. original <laughs> iteration and then right. later on um the kind of original Mark Davis drawings turned into something that are more kind of PC and Johnny Depp now but right. um yeah, it was really about this kind of adopting a certain type of um, playfulness in terms of slips of the tongue and these um, mishaps in language that seem to kind of fuel so much of, of your guys's practice as well. And in terms of um, both the poetic works, but also publishing initiatives like uh, like Barney Magazine, your publication, or I guess in of itself, The Wedding of Everything and Fear of Poetry as these kind of um, double entendres of uh, a scene or something. And so I guess going back to that, this kind of idea of the fear of poetry, I guess when I, what I meant is um, that there's something very sort of saccharine about the idea of poetry, capital P, right. um, something very sentimental, which people have a sort of um, adverse reaction to, at least in the sphere of pop, pop culture. Like there's an idea that po people have about poetry. And I think that Gail Kaczynski really plays around with that format using Bob's language from The Wedding of Everything and the poem Pure of Poetry itself from whence the title comes mm -hmm. and um, really uses it to play into the kind of theatricality and provisionality and sort of setup of poetry as this thing which has a kind of certain historical composure to it, yet experiences a kind of let's say devolution throughout the film from the raucous night of to the hangover the day after that you sure. so valiantly suffered through <laughs> i made it yes. i mean you know what you just said about kind of you know the reaction against sort of the high toned you know, the people have an adverse reaction adverse reaction to verse um and this was aside from all the other themes that you've touched on and many more, this was a kind of a definitional thing with this gang too, which was a reaction against that mode of poetry and to try to bring it down or kind of mock it a little bit many times, you know? So there is a kind of a self mockery, definitely of, 
extreme irony to some of the work here and and Bob's look at his tux in the movie you'll see it's like yeah. the most florid white ruffly tux you could ever rent yeah it's amazing and then followed up by something like Ed Smith's recital of I think he's reading from Return to Lesbos and yes uh you know he's so serious and it's so deadpan and people are kind of crying laughing in the crowd and drinking yeah. and he just is relentless in this kind of performativity or something and I think there's something that's really kind of um yeah there, there's something about the the sphere of poetry within the context of beyond baroque as i think i was saying both this kind of institution um with a very kind of great historical significance to this day in terms of sort of ballet letters and poetic scenes and so on but also it functioned as this kind of clubhouse for the quasi legit desires and fantasies of a very out of control, imaginative um, imaginative poetry scene where kind of these temporary systems of performativity, of um, readings uh, were given allowance to, to run rampant and in that kind of create this, um, this underground history that to my, you know, that became sort of cultish yet very much under documented. And, and I think, um, you know, in that sense, it lends itself, I mean, not to say that theme parks or so are, are underexposed, but they're certainly <laughs> underexposed in their uh, kind of critical significance to a way that we see the world people. And so for me, Beyond Baroque was this haunted house. It was this kind of thrill ride, at least to read into. And maybe that's just a kind of uh, a sort of... Um, a fanatical way for me to approach um, reading into an archive or reading into something with canonical significance with from a different perspective of being on the ride of being there reading your works of experiencing these things as if I was there, which I wasn't clearly but um, but yeah I think that's where the, the sort of the ride and it's it's sort of thrills and scariness and so on came into yeah, it. That's for sure. And you know, you mentioned we. Get, I think you used the phrase "giving license," and I should just kind of a, a point of whatever a clerical order, or whatever. During this period, the director of Beyond Brook was Jocelyn Fisher, and she gave us license to do what the f ever we wanted to do. So I mean, because she knew these were we were artists. We were, you know, we were making something happen. That include her letting me do. You know whatever music program I wanted to do, so the programming all these nutty um, uh, uh, sh punk rock shows. So let's just kind of get into that just a little bit more. We discussed artistic microcosms, how the Bob Flanagan Wedding of Everything combined film, art, publishing, poetry, and music. Um, I should mention there's a whole musical segment in the movie, and in there, Bob Flanagan references Planet of Toys, which was the band we had at the time that evolved into another band, Idiot Bliss. And um, and and even after Dennis left the organization, Benjamin Wiseman came in and started doing performance, um, uh, the performing arts program. So this ambition did not stop; it kept going. And so I just wondered, in your installation, The Haunt, was there? Um, were you able to kind of capture those other sides of it, the, the art and the music that was part of the, all that and grand ambition? I mean, I think it's, um, and, you know, maybe before we start wrapping this up into actually watching pure poetry, I should say that, you know, The Haunt was created in collaboration with Twisted, Experimental Twisted, um, who run a kind of haunt um, in, in Highland Park uh, every year, and that I had been going through uh, to every Halloween courtesy of Dennis Cooper and when I knew I wanted to do this I got in touch with them because of how like these kids are geniuses every hunt I've been to is amazing it's been really kind of everything's very sculptural there's a very kind of um keen uh attention paid to to artifice and surface and to kind of DIY special effects and this kind of beautiful backyard quality which comes together through really simple means but at the same, at the same time is very kind of effective in terms of um, and having a total experience and so when I presented the materials from my thesis and was like well I, I'd like to build a haunted house based on this it became something where very intuitive where we were sharing 
um, artworks from the period. And suddenly I kind of felt myself sending them everything I had and right. sending them music and sending them writing that I'd been doing and artworks from the period. And we sort of um, workshopped it for for a couple months while we were while we were effectively developing the the haunt which actually in its first iteration was supposed to be a ride where we wanted to build a one track sort of bayou experience through these things and it was absolutely totally poo-pooed by the Huntington yeah. um immediately for understandable reasons maybe yeah. but immediately and so I think that it was very, very fluid for us to suddenly have Mike Kelly involved or the Mike Kelly Foundation who gave us a piece or to mm -hmm. kind of call up Tony Orsler who like really generously allowed us to recreate a piece that was never made, XC, which was a performance mm -hmm. done with Mike Kelly. Mm -hmm. um, and sort of through these discrepant um, objects throughout the 1980s create the sense of an atmosphere and a place. And, and for sure it's not... Um, chronologically viable it's not uh historically accurate to a specific type of uh event or anything you know these are pieces that span many years that come from different points in the beyond baroque wedding of everything and and um sort of really come together like a like a nightmare <laughs> piece mm. together from discrepant fragments of this kind of um publicly available cultural memory or something of that is beyond baroque and and that's for sure and there's really even though you've articulated it so well there's no really way to capture what you've done or you have to experience it anybody who's in southern california just get your ass over there and see this installation beyond baroque it's like nothing else you've ever seen you didn't have to have been part of the gang to to see that it's really an overwhelming experience in my ambition i have neglected to watch the clock so we're over time and um we're gonna go to the film now i mean i guess that's it i um anything else you want to say sabrina no except that i think you know in, in watching fear of poetry it's also i guess important to note that it is a rough cut um, and that there's a lot of footage that didn't survive. Um, it's something that is a very kind of bijou. It's really the ghost of ghost of a document and um, all the more special for it. But yes, that's maybe something to be thought of. So, all right, everybody. Thank you. And, yeah, thank you. And everyone, please enjoy. And Sabrina, we'll talk soon. Talk soon. Thank you. Bye.